Bible or tablet with you this morning or whatever you prefer to use to study the Word. Uh, let's go ahead and raise those up high together and make our weekly declaration, shall we? This is the Word of God. It is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God abides forever. It's a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I believe everything it says. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. And everyone agreeing said, Amen and Amen. Well, if you are a guest with us this morning, we want to once again welcome you. We have been going through a study out of the book of 2 Peter. And we have seen that 2 Peter are Peter's last written words to the church. And therefore, we should take them uh, very, very seriously. Usually, the, the last words that, that a person speaks or writes uh, before they die, and he was to die just uh, uh, shortly after writing this uh, epistle, uh, we should really take note of because they're things that uh, are very important to the person writing and, uh, of course, important to the Holy Spirit as he is inspiring Peter to uh, pen these words. And so uh, what we have seen so far uh, is that Peter is highlighting the faith of the believer. And the first thing that he highlights is a familiar faith. Uh, Peter writes that, that his readers had the same kind of faith as the apostles did. And so it was one faith versus many faiths. They were in unity in regard to what they believed about uh, Jesus Christ. Second, it was a focused faith meaning that they focused on the person of Jesus Christ. They made the main thing the main thing. They didn't focus on being religious or, or other types of things like that. They focused on Jesus. Third, it was a foundational faith, meaning that their faith, as well as our faith, is founded upon the righteousness and the goodness of Jesus Christ and not our own self-righteousness or our own good works. Then we saw that it's a fruitful faith as uh, Peter highlighted in chapter 1 eight specific virtues that should be evident in the life of the believer. And so we should be bearing forth those uh, uh, fruits, those character traits in us and amongst us. We then saw that uh, it's also a forever faith, as Peter talks about the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then we saw him highlight that it is also a firm faith. He says that we are to make certain God's calling and choosing upon our lives. And that phrase, make certain, means to be fixed or to be firm. And so our faith shouldn't be flimsy. <laughs> it should be firm in the Lord. And that was just in chapter 1. Then, last week, we were in chapter 2, where Peter opens up with the word but. It's a transitional word, so he shares, he lays down all these things about our faith in Jesus, and then he goes, but... In the last days, there will be false prophets and false teachers who will speak false words. And so chapter 2, the entirety of it, of it, focuses on a false faith. Just like there is a true Christianity, there is also a false Christianity. And uh, Paul, or excuse me, Peter is warning and cautioning the church, uh, letting them know, hey, don't believe everything you hear. <laughs> there 
there, there is a false prophets out there that misrepresent the Spirit of God, and there's false teachers out there that misrepresent the Word of God. And so he spends an entire chapter focusing on this because it is so profound and so important for us to uh, receive and to understand that. Now, today we enter into chapter 3. And the entirety of chapter 3, uh, Peter is focusing on a future faith. A future faith as he's talking again about the last days and he's talking about a new heaven and a new earth that is going to come. And so this future faith speaks of a faith that really postures and positions us towards the future. And there's three things that Peter covers in chapter 3 as he highlights this future faith of believers. The first is remembrance. Remembrance. To move forward in the future, sometimes we need to look back to the past, believe it or not. Remembrance. The second thing is resistance. That in the last days, there, are going, there is going to be severe and significant resistance that will uh, come upon all those who believe in Jesus Christ and who uh, preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. And so, remember, there's going to be resistance be aware of this. And then the third thing that he closes with is reward. Reward. Yes, there's going to be a lot of resistance. Yes, a lot of people are going to go through dark and difficult times. But we must realize that there is a reward waiting for us in the future. And so that is how this last chapter is basically broken down into. The first couple of verses, remember uh, the, the middle passage, uh, resistance, and then the final word speaks of our <laughs> reward. And so, with that introduction, would you turn with me, if you're not there yet, to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter is in your New Testament, if you're not familiar with uh, the Bible. As a matter of fact, you can go to the very last book in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, and just turn a couple of pages left, and uh, you'll uh, pass Jude, and you'll pass 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, but right before 1st John is 2nd Peter, and again, we will be in chapter 3, <laughs> and uh, we pick up in verse 1, where it says this, This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring you up, stirring up your sincere mind, notice, by way of reminder. And so there's the remembrance, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. And so Peter says, as he begins to wrap things up in this epistle, he, he says to the church, there's some things that you need to remember in order to go forward. Again, there are some things that you need to remember in order to go forward. And there's three specific things that he highlights in verses 1 and 2. The first is he says, remember the words of the holy prophets. And this is pointing back to the prophets in the Old Testament who spoke of and prophesied in regard to the person of Jesus Christ. He ne next mentions the words or the commands of our Lord and Savior. 
And then the third thing he wants us to remember is not only the words of the holy prophets, not only the words or commands of our Lord and Savior, but number three, the words of the apostles who, get this, the apostolic writings explain and expound upon the Old Testament prophets and what they wrote and what they said, as well as the commands and the words of Jesus Christ. And so, listen to the words of the apostles, uh, you know, be aware of their epistles, what they're teaching, what they're writing, what they're speaking, because they explain and they expound upon the prophetic word of old, as well as the commands of of Jesus. It was St. Augustine who said this. He said, The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. I like that. I like that because it's true. And what it means is this. The Old Testament and the New Testament are interconnected, intertwined, and interrelated. Now, you guys may remember that after uh, Jesus had his six trials and he was eventually uh, crucified on a cross, and three days later he rose from the dead, and uh, he appears to two of uh, his disciples that were walking on a road to Emmaus. And he just kind of shows up, he catches up with them, or, or whatever it was. And uh, it, it's, it's an amazing uh, story to read about these two men on the road to Emmaus. Because in Luke chapter 24, verse 27, it says this, Then, beginning with Moses, who represents the law, and all the prophets, who represent the prophets, the law and the prophets, he, that is Jesus, interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now, there's a lot of Bible studies that I would have liked to have attended over the years if I was alive. But I can't think of a more exciting Bible study to attend. If I had one Bible study that I could attend, it would be the one that Jesus gave these two disciples on the road to Emmaus when he took everything, not most things, not some things, but everything pertaining the law, Moses on one hand and the prophets on the other, and every single thing he interpreted for them explaining how they related to him. How cool is that? Now, <laughs> Peter, in verse 1, makes mention of his first epistle because he says this is the second letter I'm now writing to you. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, he writes this, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would, that would come, that's Jesus, Jesus was the grace that was to come, to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. And, and, and so what, what we see here is Peter, both in his first epistle and his second epistle, he's drawing attention to the holy prophets of old and the things they wrote about, the things they spoke about, the things they prophesied about in regard to the person of Jesus Christ. Now, <laughs> in recent years, a well-known mega church pastor made this statement. He said this, Christians need to unhitch the Old Testament from their faith. Now, perhaps this popular pastor forgot 
that Jesus and the apostles frequently quoted the Old Testament and that the New Testament quotes or refers to the Old Testament, get this, 855 times. That means about 27% of the New Testament is quotations or references to the Old Testament. And again, let us remember that these are the last written words of the Apostle Peter, and he is intentionally pointing us to the profound importance of the sacred scriptures, both old and new. Those spoken by the prophets, those spoken by Jesus, and those spoken by the apostles. And so, loved ones, it is impossible for us to unhitch the Old Testament from the New Testament faith. Now, we read on in verse 3 of 2 Peter, chapter 3, and it says this, Knowing this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust. Verse 4, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, uh, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with Water And so, what we see here in verse 3 and in some other passages is that Peter, uh, as he talks about remembrance, one of the things that he wants us to remember is the promises of God. He highlights the promises of God. And, and uh, notice or recall that Peter mentioned the precious and the magnificent promises of God in chapter 1, verse 14 of his second epistle. The Apostle Paul wrote, For as many as are the promises of God, they are yes and amen in Christ. Now included in those precious and magnificent promises of God is the return of Jesus to the earth and his promise of establishing a new heaven and a new earth that Peter will uh, address in the next uh, few verses. And so Peter, he wants us to remember these things. But the false prophets who again misrepresent the Spirit of God and the false teachers who mis misrepresent the Word of God, they denied this as being true and that's why Peter needed to write this epistle. But we also have to remember back in chapter 2 where these false prophets and these false teachers, wolves in sheep's clothing, they also denied Jesus who Peter refers to as the master who bought us. And so they not only denied his return, they denied uh, Jesus and who he truly was and what he truly did for us upon the cross. And so guys, he'll, here's the deal. When you get Jesus wrong, you get everything wrong. Would you say that out loud with me? When you get Jesus wrong, you get everything wrong. Now, we see then, after Peter highlights the importance for us to remember, he then begins to address the resistance that is going to come in the last days. Again, verse 3 through 7, know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that again, by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Verse 7, but, his, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment, and 
destruction of ungodly men. And so here in verses 3 through 7, uh, Peter is highlighting the resistance that is going to come uh, upon believers in the last days. And he tells us, in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking. Now, Peter got this from Jesus, who in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39, Jesus said this. Bless you. Thank you for thanking me. Okay. Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39, it says this, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like, notice, the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and given, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. And so... Jesus says it's going to be just like in the days of, of Noah. In the last days there will be mockers who will come with their mocking. And the word mock, it means to laugh at, to scoff, or to deride. Again, to laugh at, to scoff, or to deride. And a mocker is someone who takes lightly what they should be taking seriously. A mocker is someone who downplays things. They have a flippant attitude, and they attempt to write it out of the script. And so, the way they do this, Jesus said, is, is where is the promise of His coming, mocking specifically the promises of God? Where is the promises of His coming? Since long ago... Nothing has changed. Well, nothing has changed for them because they do not have eyes to see and ears to hear. But you see, those who have been touched by the Master's hand know very well that it's not the same. That God is still at work in the world today. And so, where's the promise of His coming? And one of the false teachings that Peter confronts in this letter to the church is the teaching that Jesus wasn't going to return to earth. And I find it interesting that because of their mocking, they actually fulfill prophecy by mocking prophecy and the promises of God. They are a fulfillment to God's promises. And so, Peter, he highlights the resistance to Christ and Christianity that will be predominant in the last days. And how people will mock Christians, and they will mock what we believe, they will mock Jesus, and how Christians will become sport. And mocking Christians will become a popular practice, kind of like what we see in the world today. Oh, how Christ is being mocked by some. Oh, how Christians are being mocked by some. Oh, how what we believe in regard to Jesus and His promises are being mocked by some, and it's becoming more and more and more pre prevalent and predominant as the days draw near. And so, as we look at Peter's last written words to the church, he talks about remembrance, he, he warns us about resistance, and then notice the last thing that Peter chooses to emphasize is reward. Reward. Verses 8 through 9, it says this, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord 
One day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its work will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people are you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And so, uh, Peter talks about our reward. And Peter, he wants to assure us that Jesus is coming again. Guys, as a matter of fact, the return of Jesus is one of the most dominant themes in the entire Bible. Listen, 1,845 times it is spoken to or alluded to. One out of every 30 verses in the Bible hits on this theme. That means one-fifth of the Bible addresses the end of days and or the second coming of Jesus. Now, check this out. For every one verse that speaks of Jesus' first coming, there are eight verses that speak of His second coming. And so, just as we were assured that Jesus came the first time, we are eight times more assured that He's going to come a second time. Twenty-one times Jesus referred to His return, and fifty times we are told to be ready for it. Now, you may recall when Jesus was with His disciples in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, Jesus, He wrote this. Let me uh, read this for you. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Jesus says to His disciples, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in Me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Hallelujah. The promise, I will come again. And so guys, what Peter is saying to us in his second epistle is that we, we need to look back to the scriptures and the holy men of old. We need to look around at the signs of the times because uh, in the last days there will be scoffers. And we need to look forward to the sure promise of the future coming of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see this word look and looking next week. But he, he talks about looking forward. And my question to us is, are we really looking forward to the coming of the Lord? I hope so. I truly do. And so, look back at the Scriptures, look around at the scoffers, and look forward to the soon and coming Savior. Now, I want to draw our attention back to verse 5, where it says that, excuse me, verse 6, and if He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, to destruction by reducing them to actions, having made them an example uh, to those who would live uh, go ungodly lives thereafter. Now, let me look at the... Uh ah, wrong chapter. So again, verse 5, 
He says, For when they maintained this, it escaped their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water through water and the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water. And so in verse 4 though he says that it was from the beginning of creation. The beginning of creation. Peter affirms creation. Peter affirms creation. And guys, this is important because those who deny creation are also those who usually deny that there is a creator. They also deny Jesus' divinity as well as his second coming. And it's very interesting how evolution and atheism is closely linked together. Evolution and humanism also go hand in hand. And he's saying even the, the false prophets and the false teachers acknowledge that there is a creation. And Peter is affirming this in his writing. You see, guys, if you remove the creator from the picture, you can then paint outside the lines and the picture becomes whatever you want it to be. And that is what we have today. Everyone is painting their own picture. Everyone is coming up with their, quote, own truth. Everything is relative when you throw out the Creator. And when the Creator is Jesus Christ that the Apostle John and other places in Scripture points to, that changes everything, you see. And he highlights in verses 6 and 7, we read it a few times, that by the word of God in verse 6, and by his word in verse 7. And so when God speaks, we should take notice, just like Peter does here. And we read that the earth's first destruction was by water. I think it's 71% of the earth is water. And remember how they mocked Noah as well when he was building an ark? But Peter reminds us here, as resistance comes, that the earth was destroyed once, and it was destroyed by water. And then, notice in verse 10, the second time the earth will be destroyed is by fire. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavens will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. There's a number of times the word will is in that verse. You might want to circle it. It's emphasizing something. It will happen. It will happen. It will happen. And so I point that out to say that this is not a figurative teaching, as some try to make it out to be. Loved ones, it is a literal fire that will literally destroy the earth. And I know that that does not sit well with our environmentalist friends, and I include myself in that group. I love God's creation. It's amazing. And I believe that we should be much better stewards of it. We really should. But this isn't a real environmentally friendly passage of Scripture, is it? I, I read this and I think, but God, your creation is so awesome. I've been to the uh, Bavarian Alps and it took my breath away. I've seen the Austrian countryside and it's just, it's beauty. I've driven through the, the majestic Canadian Rockies. I've visited the Grand Canyon and Yellowstone and the Grand Tetons and Glacier National Parks. I live along the beautiful Redwood Coast. Guys, I've even been to Oric. <laughs> 
Now granted, we needed to save up for that <laughs> because of its fine dining and exquisite lodging. I've been around. But all joking aside, here's the deal. Here's the deal. What we need to understand here, th this shouldn't frighten us. What we need to understand is that God has something even better in store for us with the new heaven and the new earth and we cannot cling and hold on to the old when God wants to do something new. And as much as we love this earth and all of its beauty, and we should, it will be nothing in comparison to the new heaven and the new earth. And Peter is saying in chapter 3, guys, don't let the naysayers get to you. The, 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 the Lord is not slow about His promise. You see, God never acquiesces or bows to the timing or the wisdom or the will of man. Nor does God drag his feet, Peter say. But notice, why does he wait? He waits for a very important reason, and it's this. Because of love. He waits because of love. Peter puts it this way, he's not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, here it is, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. <laughs> Peter is saying that it's all about love. And the fact of the matter is that when we ignorantly challenge the promise of God regarding His coming, we are actually challenging His love for people. It's not His promise we're challenging. In actuality, it is his love for people. And the fact that one of the people he is waiting to come into his kingdom is the very person who mocks the promise of his coming. And if you're one of those mockers, he's waiting for you because he loves you. And Peter tells us that in the Lord's economy... One day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. You see, loved ones, God lives in the eternal now. He's not restricted by time. God is light and therefore he transcends the time and space continuum. And when I read about this, the, the Lord being slow about his promise, I, I, I think of the example... <laughs> Of, uh, per, I know some, some have children here today, and this is a very real thing that you can relate to. Others have had children, and when you had your children, you, you would oftentimes go on a road trip, right? And as you go on the road trip, you head out, and 10 minutes into the trip, what did the kids say? Are we there yet? And we're kind of like kids on a road trip. You know, God, He lives in the eternal. Now, He sees things not in a myopic way like we do, but through eternal eyes. And, and we're, you know, somewhere here on the, the, the timeline. Ho hopefully it's, it's close. I think it is. But our question, because we have no idea how to look at things through the eyes of eternity, our question is, are we there yet, Lord? Are you coming yet? And the parents, as they're on the road trip, will, will, will remember, we, we, we have to go and we have to pick up your cousins on the way. And then they forget about the, the, the trip and, oh yeah, our, our cousins are coming along with us. We're going to have more people on this ride, you see. 
And as you continue down the road, perhaps there's an accident and you pull over and you help the people and even help save someone who is about to die. You see, those stops are important. Those delays are important. Listen, God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. There's this old classic, <laughs> great song that I think the title of it is People Get Ready. There's a train that's coming, picking up passengers from coast to coast. You see, loved ones, God wants as many passengers on board as is possible. He wants the train to be filled to capacity. And there will be a time in God's sovereignty when the last person enters into the kingdom and then that time will come. We will reach our destination, but because of love, God is patient concerning His return. And for those of us who have lost ones that you want to see born and entered into the kingdom of heaven, aren't you glad that He hasn't come yet? Because there are no second chances, you see. And in verse 10, Peter says, He will come. He will. That's an emphatic statement. And again, as Peter pens his last written words, he wants us to walk in the assurance of his promise, as well as the fact that there is a judgment for those who reject him. But there's also a reward. He will come. A reward that awaits those who receive him and walk by faith and not by sight. Would you stand with me? And let's close in this uh, word of prayer together. Let's pray this out loud, shall we? Let's begin. Jesus, our God and Savior, we thank you that your promises are sure and they now never fail. We also thank you that you are not slow about your promise and that your love for the lost is what restrains you. Prepare us for the last days and help us to look back at the scriptures, look around at the signs of the times, and look forward to your return. We pray this in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask the uh, elders and the prayer team to come forward. Song of worship and a time of prayer for anyone who has need for anything. Whatever it might be, remember he's a present help in time of need. Whether you're in transition, whether you're struggling, whether you need healing, whatever it is, God is concerned. And he wants to meet you wherever you're at. And should you be here this morning and you've really never taken that step where you have placed your, both your faith and your life in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, a lot of people believe in God, and Scripture acknowledges that. But it also says uh, even the demons believe in Jesus. They, they know that there's a God. They know that Jesus is, is God. But, but belief in and of itself is not what grants a person into heaven. What grants a person into heaven is Jesus. I am the door, he said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So it's not by being religious. It's not by coming to church. It's not even just believing that there is a God, whatever that might be in our minds. The scriptures point us to one person, Jesus Christ. 
I want to encourage you, if you've never made that step towards him, would you do it today? It's the greatest decision that you'll ever make. And he's waiting for you because of love. Because of love. Would you enter into his love this morning and step to that door into eternity? So that as he spoke in John chapter 14, where I am, there you may be also. I want to encourage you to make that step today. God bless you guys. If you need prayer, come and receive it. If you, you want to talk about Jesus and eternal life, come and talk to, to, to me about that. Or Peter. Peter, could you raise your hand? Peter's our director of student ministries. Either one of us would love to, to speak with you. God bless. People get ready. There's a train that's coming.